Thanks very much, David, for the uh, invitation. And uh, I'm honored that my afternoon uh, date is uh, Professor Addington. So pleasure to be speaking with, with her uh, at following this. Um, and I really enjoyed the morning session uh, very much. So I'm excited on where this uh, might go uh, from here. I'll admit, um, uh, first, I am certainly not a scientist. And I have great admiration for the science of this, uh, this mode of thinking and this mode of working. Um, I consider myself um, very much a kind of speculative realist when it comes to design making, design visioning. And uh, I really appreciated uh, Sheila's comment about the imagination. I, I use that as part of, I expend a lot of energy on the imagination, as many of my colleagues do as well. <laughs> Maybe too much energy. Um, so I called this talk uh, Energy Publics, uh, Five Points on Energy in Place. And I like the provocation of being in the topic called location. I think a lot about site. In fact, I would say, only discovering this maybe in recent years, I think my, my greatest interest in architecture is the question of where does the site begin and end? And I think all of my work relates to that question. Um, so I almost start more with a larger scale thinking. And hopefully, if there's enough traction, I get down to a smaller scale um, application. Uh, the work I'm showing today is all uh, unbuilt work. Two, two or three of the projects are new. And I'm excited that two of the projects that start out as pure speculation uh, have gotten some steam towards uh, reality. And I'm in the midst of that now. And I'll, I'll point those out to you, which is very exciting to think that you begin a project not knowing if there is client or if there's agency, but then discovering along the way that it, um, it has an audience. And uh, that's, that's uh, uh, an exciting way to begin. OK, so um, as I mentioned, I'm interested in this question of site. So I wanted to put forward this term, uh, environment, which uh, my studio uh, were about four or five, uh, typically on average, four or five uh, staff. And we think a lot about this with every project is where does the site end and begin, but also this notion of environment. And I really love definitions. Sometimes in lectures can be a bit dull and practical. But this is just a, a really rich uh, reading of this term, environment. Um, in partic particular, I'd like to highlight the third definition, which I think is a wonderful way, a kind of liberating way to think about design and its capacity, is that the definition of environment are literally all of the elements over which a designer has no control and that affect a system's or its inputs and outputs. And um, that's both terrifying, but I think also equally incredibly liberating to think that, uh, and I think Nicholas Necroponte and, and some of his interest about um, uh, the kind of uh, willingness to let uh, control slip by the wayside, I think, is an empowering uh, perspective on this idea. Um, quickly uh, leveraging that into notions of energy, um, I just wanted to remind you that the idea and notion of energy being public in any way is still quite new. It was, it was in the 1930s where something like the Tennessee Valley Authority and its, and its uh, desire to harness or capture uh, the environment's uh, riches um, was, was used and, and quite a powerful tool even today. I think 2010 TVA's uh, revenue was $11.5 billion. Um, and this is a very successful organization that harnesses many um, different powers together in one. So this notion of energy being public or um, what kind of place it has, I think, is a new idea. So these are the questions uh, I'm, I'm asking with this talk that I'm going to try to keep within my 12-minute timeline, um, is does energy have a place today? Um, and what is the public nature of energy? And as I said, I, I think more through a kind of speculative realism uh, in our practice. And so I really use design and the capacity of design and the, the capacity of case studies. So the specificity of a project is very important to me. I'm not very good at making pie charts or graphs or, or things that are, but, but have great respect for them. I, I, I don't, I'm not good at that. Um, so I'm going to hopefully present five points uh, towards an, a, a new conception of an energy public. Um, and these are my five points. One is a, a reminder about the campfire and the campsite. Two, I'm going to ask if you speak energies. Three, I, I'm requesting that you know your umwelt. Uh, four, uh, I'm inviting you to play the world game. And five, um, I'm hoping that you will interact with your energy. So let's start with the campfire. What a good place to start. Um, and we can't talk about the campfire without talking about Bannum's 
introduction of the campfire in the architecture of the well-tempered environment. And many of you probably know, uh, Banham used the campfire as a, a kind of prod of a, of, a, of a conundrum, of a dilemma, of if a tribal people has a uh, gathering of wood, do they use this wood to burn for uh, heat and warmth, or do they use this uh, wood to construct uh, a shelter in which to maintain warm thunder, and that, that kind of dilemma. Um, equally, the idea that the, the fireplace, uh, the campfire, is literally a thermodynamic machine, and that it offers this zone of radiant heat and light, and uh, number two, its downwind trail of warmed air and smoke, so it has a kind of residue with it as well. Equally, uh, Banham introduced the tent as this primitive hut, simple, simple structure, a membrane that deflects wind and excludes rain. Um, so in a way, these two elements are, are a, a kind of core or basic instruments of architecture and space making as it relates to uh, energy. So this was a project we did for the Chicago uh, Architecture Biennale last summer. Um, looking at a kind of domesticated wilderness, this was a bit of, we were the only Canadians in the uh, Chicago Biennale, so it gave us a chance to kind of play with Canadian identity and Canadianness and some of those perceptions, whether they're actual or not. Um, and we'd, we'd noticed that there was an immense amount of energy invested in the innovation of the tent, and really, again, admired that mountain equipment co-op, all of these corporate entities, and, and some really brilliant designs and innovations and materials had, had really been at the forefront of that. And, and even gear, the kind of evolution of gear, this is you know, an outdoors person laying out, this is what I'm gonna live off of for a month. This is the idea of like, you know, the kind of heroic nature of I'm living off of this stuff out in the wild. Um, but then recognizing that things like campgrounds and especially car camping was incredibly underwhelming and incredibly suburban and had no identity to it. So our, our place of experimentation was the question of can you make urban or urbanized uh, collective campgrounds and what does collective behavior mean uh, when you're out in the wilderness? Uh, often it means sharing resources and so forth. So we made two things. We made uh, a series of these brochures that you would normally find when you enter, let's say, a provincial park in Canada or a state park in the US. You would arrive and you'd get one of these nude pr newsprints that tells you what to do with your waste, uh, what kind of firewood you can or can't use, where the showers are, that sort of thing. Um, and then we made a, a singular architectural model that had a gradient of landscapes across it from a, from a plains to a wetland to a kind of sh Canadian shield landscape to a more forested landscape and projected these five scenarios of collective camping. Um, and uh, tried to be uh, kind of democratic about the representation of these, but they were always about forms of collective occupation in, in the landscape, how to deal with literally the, the fire the campfire, how to deal with wastewater in this particular scheme, which was called closed loop, which had to do with a kind of zero footprint or low footprint camping. Um, and this was the how-to manual, how to occupy the site, where does your water go? And all of these sites were meant to come pre-equipped with tents. So tents were integrated into the campsite uh, as, as a kind of tool. So this is the closed loop model in the foreground. Uh, some uh, representations of that in a wetland. And we saw this one really as hovering at a hinge between wand ladder, uh, water and land. Um, and so we did this uh, five times. And, and each time we were asking, well, where does the campfire go? Where does the stored wood go? Where, what do people do with their waste? What, how do they gather their water? Um, and uh, how, what, what does privacy mean in this? And uh, you know, maybe not always energy-related questions, but questions about uh, density and collectivity in the wild. Um, and, and this project, uh, through uh, a kind of CBC radio pod, uh, broadcast, actually had, had picked up some interest from Parks Canada. So we're actually now working with their strategic visioning department, which I didn't even know they had, um, um, in, in possibly piloting a, a campsite. So this, this is a sort of exciting byproduct of a uh, project that is cooked up internally. My second question to you is, would you like to speak energies? Um, and uh, energies is uh, a language, um, a kind of electrical language developed by Howard Odom, who is an ecologist, American ecologist. And, and, and this is a, a kind of code um, tour that uh, Odom and his collaborators would use to understand a um, contained uh, ecosystem. 
So the, you get, these are the kind of languages like switches and so forth of what is the source of energy, what is, where is energy stored, how, where, where is an interaction point between energy, uh, what's a self-limiter, and, and, and then I think even energy loss is represented. And so he would do these um, kind of uh, electrical diagram, wonderful electrical diagrams of uh, ecosystems. So this, for example, is, um, I think it was shrimp, yeah, shrimp mariculture of coastal Ecuador. So this black line that you see around the edge here is the pond proper, but around it you have all these wonderful other things that are very abstract to most ecologists like markets and capital and labor, but then other things that are difficult to estimate or maybe are unpredictable like rain and, you know, and environmental factors that are external to that bubble. And I think this is a fascinating and challenging way to think, but I think um, it's a again a very empower, empowering way to understand site in architecture, to read it not just as we like to think of architecture as being this box only, um, but, I, but I, I like to think that there are possibilities and in design interventions in here that can be a bit more entrepreneurial, maybe. Um, I'm going to breeze through this project. It's an older project, but I think it fits this idea of energies, which looks at a, a body, an oversalinated body of water in California called the Salton Sea. Uh, it has a lot of political uh, complications as it comes by the uh, edge uh, border of Mexico. Uh, the Colorado River is a heavily uh, infrastructurally modified body of water. Um, it's diverted into the Imperial Valley, which is where New Yorkers are eating their, where they get their salad from when they're eating salad in winter. Um, you know, it's the kind of breadbasket of a lot of America. Um, but you can see the algae bloom in this oversalinated body of water, and it, it previously was a Riviera, so it had this wonderful heyday. Um, but now has these massive fish die-offs. These are tilapia uh, fish that have all gone belly up, and this is, you know, somewhat recent photograph of one of these motels. So you have a very complicated ecology, um, according to Odom, of this uh, body of water. And this is the uh, state of California's uh, proposals at the time. You see anything from uh, 2.3 billion to 5.8 billion, mostly to treat it like it's a dead uh, entity, and how can we kind of uh, let it slowly die. Um, and, and how can we generate a border uh, that quarantines maybe one portion with water and one portion that will go dry. And this is because it's uh, evaporating at a high rate. And as it evaporates, it gets more and more salinated. So the proposal here uh, was to, rather than using uh, the kind of uh, agrarian, the land uh, for cash and putting, dumping, uh, uh, um, waste water into the body of water, which is what's making it salinated. Uh, could there be an exchange? Could you look at uh, aquacultural uh, opportunities of that body of water, possibly even water harvesting itself, um, as well as maybe uh, curtail the um, Imperial Valley uh, productivity? So could they collaborate? So this is a representation of this uh, soft planning idea, which would be one kind of like, again, Odom's diagram, where the, the flows or elements coming in and out of that body of water would actually relate to uh, larger markets or larger economies like uh, Canada's desire for salt in the winter or uh, California's uh, desire for fresh water. Um, likewise, uh, f fish farming and algae farming and, and so forth. And so could you make a sort of soft planning system that might have key characters that are actors on that stage so th this could be maybe one proposition. Um, and, and hopefully what it, what it might do is it might offer that if the first 100 years of productivity in that region was about these elements, butter to fruits and vegetables, but that the next uh, phase might be about um, other commodities, other desirables uh, within uh, uh, a projective uh, future. And number three, know your Umwelt. So um, Jacob von Uxkull, uh, uh, an experimental biologist, characterizes um, the environment in two ways. That, that there are those that see the environment as its actual, all of the elements that you see, which is in this top image here. So this is, let's say, the perspective of a bumblebee. Um, that, they, that we might see uh, the field as everything it encompasses, but a bee edits that landscape and sees only the things that are of interest to it, let's say a flower, and then stuff that's of no interest just becomes black in the background. And I think that this perspective on uh, an environment or a landscape, um, uh, kind of who, from who or from what perspective uh, do you see that space? 
Um, this is a project we're working on related to that idea of perspective. This is uh, quite literally the most rem remote place in the world. This is the island of Tristan de Cunha, uh, which is on a volcano about 1,500 miles from Cape Town in Africa. This is a RIBA competition last summer, and uh, three teams of four teams actually are moving forward uh, in the second phase. And actually, it's been slowed down a lot by just the difficulty of communicating with the people on Tristan de Cunha. There are about 250 people that live on the island, 17 families. Um, I think there are 11 different last names you could have, something like that. Of uh, the most populous names, they all have the last name Glass. I don't know if Philip Glass is aware of that. Uh, maybe that's his origins. Um, and there's, there's basically two, two plots um, on this island. It's a, it's a volcano. Um, there is a, a portion of land called the Patches, which is there where they grow potatoes. And um, you can see uh, stone walls enclosing these patches. And each family owns a potato patch. Um, and then there is the city, uh, uh, town, sorry. Um, and what we were looking at is ways, and this was a, a question of how, how do we move forward in this century. Um, they import a lot of building materials, they import uh, some food, they've struggled with exporting rock lobster, that sort of thing. So we're looking at ways to, to merge landscape and their form of town construction by introducing uh, more urban patches, and that these would become experiments uh, for solar energy and uh, experiments for actually soil, producing soil. So that's one thing that they struggle with. Is, that's a re reason that they only grow potatoes, is they struggle with the kind of diversity in their soil. Um, this is the site. Uh, they also asked for a new administrative center. This has been a very humbling project because soon, as soon as we thought about everything literally has to be found locally. So we're working a lot with uh, Gabian walls and uh, thatch, kind of uh, modern interpretations of thatch roofs. And uh, this has been a very humbling design project to work on. And uh, I'm going to zip through this one, Play the World Game, Bucky Fuller's World Game which really has to do with about imagining a uh, kind of democratic space in which to um, play out haves and have nots and exchange systems. Um, and this project of which there are too many images, but this is a, a project we've been working on. It's a collection of case studies about the Canadian Arctic, uh, which looks at spatial practice in the North and different ways to define the North. Um, we look at utilities, we look at um, uh, so sometimes utilities are above ground. We look at snow fences, uh, the making of foundations in buildings. Just as, in a way, how have people that occupy and live in the Arctic, how have they had to adapt their environment or adapt their way of life according to these extremities? Um, even Inuit, my favorite one that I'll probably, the only one that I'll show, is uh, mussel harvesting in northern Quebec, um, which is, involves going below, below the ice as the tide recedes. So uh, you would dig a hole in the ice. You would go below in the kind of cavernous space between ice and uh, low tide water as it's retreated, collect mussels um, in this amazing kind of space between, and uh, go on your way. Last one is interact with your energy, which is the idea, and it was nice to see Iceland mentioned earlier, um, with the Alcoa plant, um, and many of you know the Blue Lagoon as well as a significant uh, tourist attraction, which is literally a, a, an accident and a man-made uh, retrofitted accident uh, that has silica and sulfur and has all these medicinal qualities. And this is a wonder way, wonderful way to think of how we might interact with energy, that you participate in it, that you're active in it, and you're engaged in it. So the last project is a, a proposal for the Land Art Generator initiative where we merged a parachute and a kite um, in Abu Dhabi. And using the Shamal winds that you find in that region, that you could have a, both a kind of almost like aerial writing, a series of these kites. Uh, this was a collaboration with Luis Calejas, um, a Colombian uh, landscape architect. Um, and that uh, you could get these kind of sky writings from this, uh, um, this field of parakites, as we called them. Um, and it would respond to different conditions um, based upon your, your appetite for interaction. So you've got the entrepreneur where you could donate money and you could get a free view from that parakite of the wonderful landscape. If you're a tourist, you could get a kind of periscope experience with that. Um, if you're an adventurer, you could actually, uh, after signing a waiver, of course, you could uh, ride up on that kite. Um, so this, this is maybe a, a, 
alternate possibility for how we uh, interact with our energy. So I just wanted to leave you with those five points on uh, energy publics. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, David and Amal. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm particularly delighted uh, at my pairing uh, with Mason. I would have loved to have been paired with anybody here today. I admire their work so much. But I've been following the work of Mason and Lola and Lateral Office for years. Uh, in addition, just what you presented, I feel like we have some great resonances in, in which to speak. And then the third thing that I was just thinking about as you spoke, uh, I really was moved by your image of TV, T, uh, the TVA dams. Given that I've had many careers in my life, and probably most of them, most of you know about a number of them. Probably no one knows that I once ran a power plant um, outside of Nashville, Tennessee, on the Cumberland River, which had its own hydroelectric dam. So I worked with TVA off and on in, in running that dam. So very odd types of connections on that. I'm going to talk about location as well, and but I'm going to talk about location in a, in a different way than it's typically talked about when we think about buildings, when we think about energy, when we think about products, when we think about materials. I'm going to talk about location not as a spatial dimension, so not as a measured dimension, and I'm not going to talk about it in relationship to an artifact, an artifact being a material, a product, a wall, a building, uh, an infrastructure. So I'm going to put forward three different ideas of how we might reconfigure what location is and sort of open up a discussion on it. And I'm going to start with the most pragmatic um, of these reconfigurings on this. An idea of attribution. In this case, the idea of attribution has to do with even where we locate the discussion about embodied energy. I'm sure that pretty much everybody in here has uh, seen this quote that comes from the Department of Energy. What I find interesting about this quote is even though it's their current statement about embodied energy, basically saying it's you know, not important uh, because it's small relative to operational energy, uh, it was something that you know, shows up uh, first in 2011. They haven't updated it since. It's, since. it's still something that you see when you click on embodied energy for the Department of Energy. It's still this sort of like notice like, we know what it is, uh, but it's not really important. So compare it as well to, so the next two slides I'm going to give you, which are sort of different ways of accounting. This is something we've all seen before uh, many, many times. We see the Sankey diagram coming out every single year. We've got our buildings, which comprise the residential and the commercial aspects of it. Uh, then there's industrial and transportation. And however you add it up, whether it's 40% or more than 40%, that's residential, commercial, and then the buildings part in terms of operating industrial buildings goes into that as well. What's really interesting from this number is embodied energy doesn't get counted to buildings. All the embodied energy that we deal with gets counted in the industrial sector and not in the industrial sector part that's attributed to operating their buildings. Basically, it's sort of all on the side over there. And as a result, one of the real key things to be concerned about is that industry has outpaced every other sector in terms of its efficiency, in terms of getting control of its emissions. And when you put embodied energy there and not in the building sector, you're not recognizing what its impacts are going to be for the future, particularly impacts when we start looking at what's happening worldwide in terms of the rate at which we're building. So the projections that are taking place right now for looking at worldwide energy use misaccounting for the role in body energy is going to play because it's being counted against a very different type of projection than the one that actually should be a piece of. And this is not sort of gone unnoticed. Uh, working group three from the IPCC finally picked up on this in 2014 and, and, and put out um, uh, put out this in, in, in uh, one of their chapters. Uh, what it's looking at is all of the embodied energy in the world right now. So that's going to be, um, that's all of these bars here. So this is accounting for all of the carbon that's now in embodied energy throughout the world as it exists. This is where they expect it to go. So they expect all of this now to be filled in. That's their projections in terms of 
what's going to be happening over until uh, 2050 in terms of how much the world is going to be building. This will be the rest of the embodied energy that we're going to be adding to it. So it's a stunning number. It's more than double. That's what, what is there right now. And if you go back to that Department of Energy number that we just looked at, the one that said that embodied energy is only about 10 to 15 percent um, of uh, operating energy of building, and of course you think about, well, if operating energy of buildings is 40 percent, then 10 percent of that would be, you know, 4 percent. Uh, what they're also showing in this chart is that they expect that future carbon emissions fully 30% of future carbon emissions will simply go into building buildings and infrastructure. This is not a set of numbers that we have been talking about. We haven't been talking about them within the field of architecture. We haven't been talking about them beyond the field of architecture because they're showing up and not really being accounted for uh, until this particular chart that came out from the IPCC on this. So this issue of attribution uh, where even the discussion is located, how we're even accounting for this. This is a really critical one to raise the level of importance in this particular area. The next one is going to be about contingency. What's, what's contingent? What's constituent? in the way that we examine things and the way we compare things. And so much of the discussion about embodied energy has been looking at, for example, our uh, so construction materials, our wall materials, our structural materials, looking for substitutes for those. We're treating the way that we do things now as constituent. We're not questioning the way that we do things now. We're sort of operating subordinate to the way that we do things now, uh, but treating those as constituent. And I'm suggesting now that many of those things can be considered as much more contingent, and I'll give you an example of this. So this is a report that came out from the Department of Energy looking at the life cycle assessment of LED lighting products. Um, and so if you think about the way that we've been approaching LED products, uh, basically as a substitute for conventional lighting systems, as a replacement in many cases for whether we're replacing uh, incandescence directly um, on, a, on a smaller task level or replacing fluorescence and high intensity discharge uh, in, a, in a larger building level. Uh, a very peculiar thing, if you think about it, because the whole way that we distribute light in buildings, particularly in commercial and industrial buildings, is based on a series of things that happened before 1939. Uh, there's no rationale for ceiling-based lighting in this day and age, and yet our lighting is still ceiling-based. And so we're worried about sort of replacing the individual lamps we're not thinking about the fact that we actually have, when we switch to something like LEDs, which have a very different infrastructure requirement than, than do anything that, that requires a ballast, uh, when we start to switch to something like LED lamps, we're not reconsidering how differently we could light. We're treating what is constituent is the technology that exists becomes the standard or the benchmark that we compare to. I mean, I compare it to uh, what's happening in a dashboard uh, of a car. Um, being a mechanical engineer, um, I, in, in, in our world, uh, the automotive industry is pretty low on the totem pole in, in terms of innovation, although in architecture we look up to it. Uh, but this is an example of actually taking LEDs, designing for what you see, as opposed to the idea, now that I'm at Yale, I always pick on Harvard, uh, this is a library uh, at Gund Hall that I'm sure a lot of you recognize. While I was a student there, it underwent this uh, energy retrofit of all of the lighting. This is back in the fluorescent days. Uh, and they came in and, uh, as you can see, no matter where you are in the library, uh, where a body can go, where a body can't go, uh, you might be near windows, you might be deep in the bowels of the library, uh, it might be circulation, it might be a stack, it's the same. You know, this is sort of relentless lighting, none of it particularly useful. Uh, but this sort of idea of as the technology changes, it's not just a question of looking for a more efficient technology, not just a question of looking for a lower embodied energy technology, but also sort of that leap in terms of re-understanding how it is that we begin to use these different types of systems, what those opportunities are to break apart what we normally consider to be constituent on that. And this next slide is actually going to relate uh, very, very closely 
uh, to what Mason showed, and I had no idea he was going to be showing his camping project. So um, about a year ago, I really wanted to get back to some of my original doctoral research uh, when I had a grant uh, from DARPA uh, to look at uh, micromachines. And so I sort of reinserted myself back into what was happening with the military in terms of micro power uh, last January. And I apologize for the slides, what they were willing to unclassify aren't particularly uh, graphically uh, pleasing, but uh, I was really fascinated uh, in the conversations in Washington on this that uh, what they had been dealing with in terms of power, both power generation um, as well as power supply, so two different things actually, was that in Afghanistan one out of three casualties involves fuel. Delivering fuel or guarding fuel, one out of three casualties related to fuel. And then on top of it, uh, the typical soldier carries 70 batteries in his or her backpack. So imagine 70 batteries for all of the different types of electronic equipment uh, that they now carry. That's, that would cover them for a 72-hour period, which is the maximum they felt, and given the weight of batteries, that they could never go longer than a 72-hour period on this. And so much of the discussions uh, were taking place in terms of sort of restaging the way operations took place, finding more strategic relationships between things, sort of challenging the idea of where uh, different types of base camps were, what a sortie would, would comprise, but all of that sort of understanding that, uh, you know, because their objective was to save lives and, and to reduce energy uh, in injuries, but all of that is sort of like a design based on a minimum energy footprint in terms of deployment. So really understanding that deployment. It's totally, in, uh, you know, a, a counterpart, what Mason was showing in terms of his camp. Matter of fact, uh, now that's my new example. I'm going to show that from now on. I'm not going to show this image anymore when I sort of talk about this idea of a strategic uh, redeployment of how people move, where resources are located, how things are shared, what's collective, what has to be individual, um, uh, what ends up being sort of like a sensor pod idea of certain types of footholds that are made that things operate from, uh, but a really interesting idea on what is what has to be con constituent, what has to be contingent on this. And the last thing it ends up being a lot more personal uh, for me. And it's sort of thinking about location, but as a phenomenal location. Again, not as a, a dimension location, but as a phenomenal location. And in some ways, it actually goes back, starts with the, the lighting example, but, but moves from there. So we see a lot about the passive house, um, a lot. And if you look at sort of these different analyses that take place in the passive house, and I'll show you two uh, that are completely contradictory, uh, the one from the Passive House Institute is trying to show how for just a teeny bit more embodied energy, uh, you're going to get, you know, this dramatic reduction uh, in uh, dramatic reduction in operating energy. And that's what makes it such a great investment. Then you come down here and it shows that it's a large amount of embodied energy that really doesn't pay off in the long run. Matter of fact, you're better off doing pretty much anything but according to this. So if you were to ask me which one is correct, I'd say I don't care. It doesn't matter to me which one is correct because I think they're asking the wrong question on this and they're wrestling with the wrong question on this. If we think about how walls actually work, uh, we have so much depended upon choosing the material. Uh, we think that performance of whether we're talking the performance of a technology or we're talking about performance of a system or performance of a wall has everything to do with the material that we use, has everything to do with the property of that material, what would be uh, an intensive property of that material. But the way walls perform have to do with their context. So one of the things about the context of walls, and these are the ones that are we'd find in, in, in all of our buildings, uh, whether we're talking about a wall or we're actually talking about uh, a human body here, is that, oops, sorry, back up a bit, uh, is that uh, this is a critical point here, uh, where that flow shifts from being laminar flow 
to become in turbulent flow. So if we look at typical conditions that we might have uh, on the interior, uh, this is insulating, this is conductive. It's about a factor of 10 difference, one to the other. Um, and so this material property that you might get in terms of conductivity is actually a very, very particular test uh, done under particular conditions. So you can compare materials in those conditions one to the other because the test is standardized, but it doesn't tell you how it's going to perform. You know, so for an example, a really easy way of thinking about this is that a strip window, a horizontal strip window, transfers half as much heat as the same window turned vertically because you're going to be affecting that zone in which that transition takes place. So it's not about the material per se, but it's about the context of the material that governs its behavior. So um, when I was doing my doctorate uh, and I was taking courses, additional courses in fluid mechanics, I was really taken by this one image in, in, in Triton's great book on physical fluid dynamics about these different ways of perturbing the boundary layer in order to initiate turbulence. And so I ended up doing a series of experiments, uh, computational experiments, where I took a variety of different devices, resistance wires, halogen lamps, uh, and little, little tiny uh, micro heat pumps to use them in order to adjust that heat transfer. So we're looking at a section right now. And you can barely see the little tiny, um, in this case, they were little, little tiny resistance wires that are located uh, in the center in order to disrupt a boundary layer and start to create different kinds of conditions in here. But the whole point of this work was to show you can go and you can build yourself a really thick wall or you can take a thin wall and actually control the behavior of the wall with very small, very strategic, very thoughtful types of interventions. So this is where I'm going to be concluding on this. And what I became very interested in then from this particular work was realizing that if we look at the whole reason we build and you know, thinking about it from, you know, even starting, uh, starting from the tent on, but thinking about it from uh, from shelter to security uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, dealing with climate control to dealing with visual uh, control. All of the different things that we demand from our buildings are really all things that operate here. We're trying to do something for the human body. We're trying to manipulate one of the phenomenological behaviors in order to do that. What it means is that when we think about location, we're really thinking about location of our intervention taking place in between the two, understanding the physical phenomena in our context, understanding how we sort of want to manipulate that phenomena, knowing how we want to interact with human physiology. And of course, we're interacting with human physiology. In some cases, if we're dealing with our sense of comfort or, or seeing something, we're also interacting with perception. But the actual place of intervention and however one might intervene, whether it's with a material intervention or some other type of intervention, it actually happens in between those two. So a real idea terms are a real challenge to the idea that location is automatically associated with the building artifact. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's I mean, really nice. Um, and actually, I think you sort of updated Rainer Banham's campfire there with your last image. I feel like I need to. Supplant, uh, supplant that kind of notion despite its simplicity. I feel like it's a more contemporary addition that you have there in terms of uh, the site, the idea of location between those uh, perception and uh, behaviors. Well, I mean, but, it, but you know, it fits within that, that same type of, I think, thematic framework. It might, might be manifest in a different way, but it, it, it fits within that framework. It's just that I think sometimes our framework is so co-opted by the material artifact mm -hmm. that you know we want to imbue um, you know authority into you know the material artifacts that we make and that's why we want the super envelope this is why uh, mm -hmm. you know we we make these decisions around those types of things yet conceptually mm -hmm. we we get that we we get that the the idea of the intervention this is why i'm so interested in in your propositions and your and your work because you know, for a long time, I also feel, besides being very material-centric, um, we're very property-centric. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, when we talk about something like a net zero energy building, um, it's actually quite a ludicrous idea if you think about it from an energy standpoint, if you think about it from a thermodynamic standpoint. I mean, you're basically taking a unit of private property right. and thinking that's the appropriate place to do an energy balance. And I was really impressed by the way that you're starting to, to sort of erode that mm -hmm. idea of property mm -hmm. as being a determinant, both in terms of the drilling down, the mm -hmm. reaching up, but also sort of like so the, this fluidity mm -hmm. of where even that line is drawn. And for me, I, I'm fascinated by this, and I'm really interested that we do this, but I don't know how. And I think that's my question mm -hmm. for you, is that how do we find a way, given the fact that we ultimately will implement according to material interventions, and we're going to implement according to property, mm -hmm. how do we instead think in these other terms, yet understand that we're going to implement in these ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, property is it determines a lot, um, certainly in an urban environment. We're working on a project right now in the Arctic, actually in the Canadian North, for um, an elder care facility. It'll be about 55 to 70 beds. And there was a point, and so the city, uh, the city of Iqaluit owns property and has site, and then there's Inuit-owned lands. There are lands that are kind of owned by no one. In fact, actually, Inuit people just voted to, or are considering whether to vote on whether there's an idea of ownership at all. But a portion, because of the size of the building, it actually has to spill over the property line between what, what might be ownable property into territory that's really used for hunting and so forth. So we're now looking at that, at that property line and, and it's a collaboration between owners in some ways to use this to make an exception to this rule. And um, this has been complicated, but I think it does get at some of these questions about what it, how, how might new notions of land use and land ownership actually help foster uh, perceptions about location and even the kind of basket, the, the, mm -hmm. the catchment area or the basket of that um, structure, but I, I, I think you're, you're, you're right on in terms of um, um, ideas about, uh, like when it hits the physical components, there's, um, I think, a lot of misunderstandings. I was gonna ask you though, do you think that, I don't know if we have time for any more, but uh, just a quick question was that, do you think that we are, um, in, our, in our kind of physical world, and these last images you show are very, sometimes microscopic, or sometimes they're about the invisible. Often your work is, in your studies, even at NASA before, was often about uh, the invisibles. Is it, do you think we are accurately approaching ways to represent the invisible, to make it tangible to those that, for which that normally is a difficult thing to understand, architecturally speaking? When, it, when you look at, let's say, for example, HVAC systems, these are boring but very conventional and uh, commonplace systems, but ways to understand rooms or buildings or heat emissions. Um, where are we in that? Uh... Yeah, I, I think that's an incredible challenge, uh, you know, for, for, for the field of architecture mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with this, uh, that this is part of, you know, how we're going to move forward in terms of representational systems of beginning to deal with these things. And in many ways, it takes us back to, um, you know, the, the keynote uh, this morning in that, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly what you said, but something about the fact that we think we know how things work, except it's almost always completely the opposite. When it, when it comes to things that are not tangible, um, our assumptions are almost always wrong. Right. You know, we, we think our senses tell us what's going on. They're actually sensing our body responding to something, but they're not sensing what's around them. Mm -hmm. Even our eyes are not particularly mm -hmm. good at mm -hmm. sort of reading uh, what's around us. It's really quite fascinating. So I think it's actually, you know, one of the many things that, that falls within our field is, as an opportunity to, to lead the world in. It is finding the different ways that we can communicate and visualize what it is that's not visualizable right, right. now in order to, to teach others what's going on mm -hmm. out there because mm -hmm. these are where these decisions are being made and what happens when we aren't able to visualize these behaviors or these phenomena we fall back on what we know right. and it's falling back on what we know which has kept us I think so much mired mm -hmm. uh, in let's just say particularly when it deals with building technologies really old archaic yeah. technologies that we Habits. still depend on mm -hmm.
<laughs> Thanks. Um, I was curious about, you had mentioned a sort of lack of imagination when it comes to the planning of the use of lighting. And I was wondering if you thought about or if you think people are focusing at all on the future of driverless cars, which really are going to happen and I think are going to profoundly alter the physical space we live in. And I don't see that much or hear that much about people. You know, people will talk about it like I'd love for my mom to not have to drive, that kind of thing. Um, but it will be a kind of revolutionary advance and it isn't going to be that long from now. I was just wondering. I would say for me, I haven't even thought about it other than for my own pleasure. You know, and uh, my, my dream of having a driverless car, but I hadn't really thought about it in, in this relationship. And actually that's, that's an intriguing example of this sort of disconnect of the visual system from a series of actions that one takes. It's actually a fantastic model, uh, you know, for, for us to be thinking about in, in, in that standpoint. So I can't answer the question in terms of have I done anything like this, and I don't know if you have. I, I have not. Uh, I've, I've seen a, a few thesis model. projects, but yeah, and I think even uh, other notions of collective, um, you know, Uber and other kinds of collective behaviors or, for example, about, like, or right, here. yeah, the urban artifacts that come with that that may disappear. Yeah, yeah I don't know how that would change a place like Houston. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a great model for sort of trying to understand this bodily disconnect we have from a series of environmental, uh, and environmental, I'm using that, yeah. uh, even yet another yeah, definition yeah, yeah, yeah. of yours. I mean, you know, what, that which surrounds us in terms of physical phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great, great model for studying that. One or two. Sorry, I just had a brief question um, based, Michelle, on your presentation. Um, we all know that things like our values are generalized uh, ideal values that may or may not have anything to do with this, but they're extremely useful in the real commercial world of pushing forward a particular agenda. The kind of bespoke, careful, contextualized analysis that you're talking about, especially things like uh, fluid dynamics, are much more difficult to translate into that kind of a context. How do you see that bridge being made? I mean, that's, that's a really big question, and it also, I think I'm at that age where um, uh, my, my, my dreams get smaller all the time. Like I said, I'm just very excited about the driverless car. I hope it ha happens before I die. But um, uh, certainly, you know, when I did that work 20 years ago, I thought it was yeah, going to happen, you know, that, that uh, it's... it's Yet even the simulation tools that I used back then are not available in the architecture world, which are kind of sad if you think about it. Um, that you know we have tools that look just like that, but it will, but one act, aren't acting at that particular level um, and, and, and depth of detail. And so I think I've really you know refined where I've been going in terms of it's going back to this idea of being strategic. So there's a sense of being strategic in terms of phenomena and really understanding how you want to intervene on phenomena. But there's also a sense of being strategic, and this is sort of where I am now, in terms of what is no longer, I'm no longer interested in what's optimal, I'm interested in what's possible. And sort of finding what the, the ideal point of strategic possibility, and that possibility might be in terms of financially, it's reasonable, something that could be deployable uh, in, in um, uh, the poorest sectors of society. What are those types of strategic operations? So the modeling of it or the thinking of it might exist in, in one realm, but then how do you pull from that to use it to ask questions about what you do in everyday life? And I'd say I'm in that range now as opposed to, um, you know, thinking that we're actually going to make big inroads in terms of the way that we really think about our buildings. I wanted to just ask, um, maybe I'll ask Mason this question, but it's pretty interesting the idea of energy publics. Um, because you know the the very idea of the public or a public has been sort of under attack, um, and many many people have thought that that you know it's not possible to kind of formulate a singular audience or a public. 
So maybe you could just um, speculate. I think it's pretty exciting to think about energy publics and um, what might be some of the characteristics. You're with the Blue Lagoon. You're kind of uh, hinting on some kind of new sensual engagement or something that's corporeal. And I'm wondering if you could, um, or collective in some way, could you muse about that a little bit? Uh, really quickly, uh, great question, Sheila. I, I, I was very influenced by um, the the book Massive Change when it came out that Bruce Mao had worked on. It was kind of a early internet book where it's a little schizophrenic to look at, but I think it collects, and I think the exhibition also collected a lot of really inspiring possibilities. It was structured by military, economics, etc. And I think for me, the premise, and it probably had driverless cars in it somewhere in that in one of the chapters about mobility, let's say. But um, what really inspired me about that book um, was the idea that in order to create or in order to pay, maybe foster uh, considerable change is that we shouldn't underestimate the possibility of seduction in that and the possibility of it to be inspiring. Um, so let's take cars, for example. Would we all want to buy an eco car? Sure, we would. Would we want to buy it more if it was a little streamlined? Maybe it was red. I, I mean seems superficial, but I think that the possibility of uh, versus uh, it to look green. Um, so I don't, I, just generally speaking, I think the, the possibility of massive change can be further enhanced and supported by, uh, I think, some of the wonderful images like that Blaine showed in, in projects um, and, in, and in your work as well and many, much of the work that we'll see today that, that says that it's not just about showing that the, the numbers work to prove it uh, in a spreadsheet, but really to complement that with something inspiring that we haven't seen before and that's what really uh, generates, I think, future possibilities in architecture. Um, so subscribe to that mode of thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much.